March 11th, 2011. Troubles coming. The most powerful earthquake in Japan's history triggers a monster tsunami. A wall of water up to 20 meters high smashes into the coastline, destroying everything in its path. But it's just the beginning of the Fukushima catastrophe. The worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. To turn the world away from nuclear power. And the greatest setback to the cause of nuclear energy in modern times. You can't count on such a fragile technology. Let's start a revolution. But is it time to step out of Fukushima's shadow? This is crazy the way we're trying to eliminate nuclear out of this conversation. It's an explosive debate. Are we going to kill people so we can turn our lights on because we have to have nuclear power? Tonight, on the 11th anniversary of the Fukushima horror, we ask, should Australia go nuclear? You're sitting on huge stores of uranium, which you could use in your own country. We've signed up for nuclear submarines. Greater endurance, faster, greater power. Why not nuclear energy? We're a weird country where scientific solutions are just not accepted by the general public. Our panel of experts investigates the case for Australia's nuclear future. How are we going to decarbonise and how are we going to maintain the lifestyle that we want? Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. Joining me, five powerful voices in the nuclear debate. Dr. Helen Caldicott, a physician who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for her anti-nuclear advocacy. Dr. A.D. Patterson, former CEO of the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Dr. Joanne Lackenby, President of the Australian Nuclear Association. Bob Carr, the longest continuously serving Premier in New South Wales and former Foreign Affairs Minister. And Dr. Mark Diesendorf, a leading environmental scientist at the University of New South Wales. Thank you for joining me. Nuclear power has long suffered a serious image problem. When most people think of nuclear energy, they think of this. Not only its connection with the most dreadful and devastating weapons on Earth, but also because the world has seen that when nuclear reactors go bad, it's hell on Earth. In 1979, a partial meltdown at the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania became America's worst nuclear accident. Seven years later, in 1986, came the catastrophe of Chernobyl. And then in 2011, Fukushima. So the central question is, can it ever be truly safe? Are we crazy to even consider it? For our experts, that question is also the battle line. Nuclear power plants are cancer factories, and yet they have the goal to say nuclear power's clean. Nuclear power is way, way, way safer than fossil fuels. I can look you all in the eye and say, no, they are not safe. Reactors in this era cannot suffer the types of disasters of Chernobyl or Fukushima. The most dangerous thing I do every day working at Australia's only reactor is drive to work. And if it goes wrong, the consequences are horrific. So what is nuclear energy? Well, basically, it's just another way of heating water and producing steam, driving turbines to create electricity, just like coal-fired power plants, but using radioactive uranium as the fuel source. Nuclear advocates say we could swap all our coal-fired power stations for nuclear energy plants. The trouble is, nuclear energy is currently banned in Australia. 
We need to look at the kind of, of country we want to have in Australia. How do we want to be living? How are we going to get energy? We need a big vision. But nuclear opponents reply with one word, Fukushima, a disaster that no one wants to see repeated. Nuclear power is a special case because over 100,000 people had to be evacuated in Fukushima. The economic damage has been enormous. Some estimates put it at 500 billion US dollars equivalent. In 2010, just before Fukushima, I was someone who'd been led to believe we're on the edge of a nuclear renaissance. I had been assured by the industry that the issue of reactor safety was absolutely settled for all time. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is right on Japan's east coast. At 2.46 p.m. on that terrible March day in 2011, a once-in-a-century earthquake, the fourth most powerful in recorded history, detonates 72 kilometres offshore. A massive tsunami hurtles towards the Japanese mainland. The Fukushima plant and its six nuclear reactors are only 10 metres above sea level. This is one of the worst case scenario events we could imagine. It's one of the worst natural disasters we've seen. Coastal marine expert Dr Hannah Power says even in Japan, one of the most earthquake and tsunami prone places on the planet, there was no way of predicting an earthquake of this magnitude. Prior to the Fukushima earthquake, there was some uncertainty about what the largest possible earthquakes we would see on fault zones were. The larger the earthquake, the rarer they are. So it's one of those things where you, know, you might not worry about an asteroid impact on Earth because it's so rare, it kind of starts to fall into the same kind of category. So are reactors capable of surviving earthquakes? Absolutely. So in Fukushima, what would have happened is whole thing starts shaking, the seismic sensors pick up an earthquake and automatically shut down that reactor. To withstand an earthquake and prevent a nuclear meltdown, reactors have a design mechanism that shuts the plant down. It's a safeguard called scramming and it worked. What we're trying to avoid is a meltdown, isn't we, it? We're absolutely trying to shut down the nuclear reactor. It is still needs to be cooled after yep, shutdown. Absolutely. And, and hence why Fukushima was on the, the, the sea coast. Yeah, because they were using uh, the seawater for cooling. The earthquake had knocked out the power grid. Emergency diesel generators kicked in, keeping the seawater pumps going that were cooling the superheated radioactive core. The tsunami has engulfed several cities. But those emergency generators stopped when the tsunami hit. An unstoppable and overwhelming force. If these reactors blow, they could wipe Japan and half of Asia off the face of the Earth. When all power was lost, Staff were working in the pitch black, desperately trying to cool and contain the reactor cores, which were now melting down. Can you imagine what that was like? I can't, no. I mean, I've never experienced anything like that scenario before. Despite heroic efforts, they could not stop the reactor cores superheating. In the days that followed, three partially melted down causing massive explosions of hydrogen, releasing clouds of radioactive material into the atmosphere. It was just absolutely hideous, hideous. And the Prime Minister of Japan at the time thought he would have to evacuate Tokyo, 35 million people. If the wind had been blowing towards Tokyo, it could have been a disaster. But 80% of the radiation that was emitted from Fukushima actually went over the Pacific.
Nearly 20,000 people died in the devastation. More than 6,000 injured. Thousands of families fled their homes. And although 16 workers at the Fukushima nuclear plant were injured, no one was killed. Millions of litres of seawater were let into the reactor cores to cool them, and some of that water leaked back out into the ocean. But the critical threat of an uncontrolled meltdown was averted. However, if Australia was to go nuclear, our geographical location puts us at a much lower risk of serious earthquakes and tsunamis. In New South Wales, for example, we really don't anticipate tsunami being larger than 10 metres or more above sea level. If Fukushima wasn't enough to scare us, anti-nuclear activist Dr Helen Caldicott says what happened at Chernobyl should warn us off nuclear energy forever. The explosive Chernobyl reactor meltdown in Ukraine in 1986 is considered the world's worst nuclear accident. It released 10 times more radiation than Fukushima. Up to a million people in Europe have died already from all sorts of cancers, genetic diseases and the like. 40% of the European continent is now radioactive from the fallout from Chernobyl. And it's Chernobyl that taints the entire nuclear debate. The case for nuclear energy in Australia is back on the table. We begin our coverage in Japan this morning. Fukushima, where the crippled nuclear reactor is. A hard sell in the shadow of the Fukushima nuclear disaster 11 years ago after one of the biggest earthquakes and tsunamis ever recorded. Both reactors are overheating. Teetering on the brink of a massive meltdown. But for many, the distaste for nuclear energy started with Chernobyl. There has been a nuclear accident in the Soviet Union. In April 26, 1986, in the Soviet Ukraine. Nuclear radiation had already reached beyond the Soviet borders. The number four reactor of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant melts down. 5% of the highly radioactive core is blown into the atmosphere, spreading over tens of thousands of square kilometres. This scene of man-made hell is seared into history. Over 300,000 people had to be evacuated from the Chernobyl area. Much has changed, though, in the nuclear industry since that accident 36 years ago. But what hasn't changed is our ongoing fear of radiation. In the aftermath of Fukushima, I visited Japan. Shall we test these? Hmm. Same as an X-ray, then, according to this. Okay. And the exclusion zone of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. You know what's shocking about this, Sergei, is that 25 years later, this is still incredibly radioactive. In these heavily affected locations, it was easy to understand why radiation is so threatening. This device is purely to detect the radiation in the air. And it is invisible and odourless, but ever present. If you belong to somewhere like this, it, <laughs> it becomes very active. The real health risks posed by radiation are of grave concern. But some say we have been sold a lie about radiation, part of the campaign used by the anti-nuclear movement. There is a, an awful lot of, shall we say, misinformation around the actual figures of deaths that can be related to the radiation. World-renowned molecular pathologist Professor Geraldine Thomas has studied the human impact of radiation from both the Fukushima and Chernobyl disasters. She says the death toll as a result of Chernobyl has been grossly exaggerated. 
There were about six million people who were living in the more contaminated areas and those people over a 25 year period were exposed to the equivalent of one CT scan. Or with Fukushima, the dose is even lower. So you can't just pluck death statistics out of the air and say, well, because Chernobyl happened, everybody who's died since then from exposure to radiation. That's just ridiculous. The officially accepted number of deaths from Chernobyl, assessed by a United Nations scientific committee, is 4,000. But Dr. Helen Caldicott says the real death toll is 985,000, although that's a figure sourced from research that critics claim has never been peer-reviewed. Your data has been questioned about... My data? Well, the data that you use... From, from the published you, medical that, data? The data which has not been peer-reviewed in Western... Let, it, I can cover that for you. Yes. It was published by the New York Academy of Sciences, looking at... Patients. Dr. Caldicott claims this paper was brought into disrepute by pro-nuclear scientists. Some people in the, National, in the New York Academy of Sciences are pro-nuclear, and they brought up that issue that it hasn't been peer-reviewed. This is the only study, and... But the, but the but estimate is... Just, just not, an just estimate correct. is over... A, up to a million people in Europe have died already from all sorts of cancers, genetic diseases and the like. 40% of the European continent is now radioactive from the fallout from Chernobyl. I, See, I, all I, of that's I, been questioned. I, I think, but I they, think it can't, is, it, they can't question what they are. It, it's really Wait. important to understand that the global place where this is discussed is the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. And what do they say? They have come to the conclusion lives have been seriously disrupted by the Chernobyl accident. But from a radiological point of view, generally positive prospects for the future health of most individuals should prevail. This is a consensus body of all the countries in the world. Well, they're wrong. What I'm wanting to know is why is this massive difference in figures and understanding of the impact on people's health? Look, there could be a million cancers induced by Chernobyl, but that would be dwarfed by the number of cancers that occur naturally over the whole period. There isn't a test of sufficient statistical power to do it. So and why are we yours? frightening people? And but I can tell you, there have been huge numbers of studies from the best minds in the world that have looked at this, and we just can't find the death toll that they're talking about. At Fukushima, nearly 20,000 people were killed during the earthquake and tsunami, but there were no official reports of deaths due to radiation. Yet, the fallout from Fukushima was disastrous for the nuclear energy industry. Former New South Wales Premier and Australian Foreign Affairs Minister Bob Carr was a nuclear advocate at the time of Fukushima. Bob Carr, what did you think when you watched Fukushima? My initial response was an accident. It seems to have been contained. It's being rescued from being catastrophic, the evacuation of 35 million people from Tokyo. And I remember saying to someone, I think this would set the industry back by a couple of years. So I was still a believer that nuclear could deliver for us. What I right now see is that it turned the world away from nuclear power. After a devastating earthquake and tsunami sparked a nuclear meltdown at the Fukushima power plant in Japan, the world simply switched off nuclear energy. But tonight, we're investigating whether it's time to flick that switch on in Australia. In 2010, just before Fukushima, I was someone who'd been led to believe we're on the edge of a nuclear renaissance. Former New South Wales Premier Bob Carr was pro-nuclear before the Fukushima disaster, but he's now changed his tune. If you're running an energy policy to keep a nation going, you can't take the risk that this flawed, lumbering, technically vulnerable technology is all of a sudden going to run into a reactor accident that takes out that amount of your capacity. After Fukushima, Japan's immediate response was to shut down nearly all of its 54 reactors. In Japan, no prime minister goes on TV and says, look, look, this is all manageable. It's not as serious as you think. 
The fact is, Japan had 54 and they scaled it back to nine. I, I, I think, think, I think you're wrong about the technology what, what, and you're also wrong about the Prime Minister because wrong, the Japanese right. Prime Minister has said <laughs> that they must reopen the reactors and that they must build new ones. And supporters in Australia say it's time for us to put nuclear power into our future energy mix. I'm a younger person and I'm worried about climate change. That's why I'm here. We need to be looking at the kind of, of country we want to have in Australia. How do we want to be living? How are we going to get energy? We need a big vision. The nuclear industry has been developing a new generation of power plants. It says they could replace coal-fired plants on the same sites and connect to Australia's electricity grid, providing clean and efficient power, which it argues would also be cheaper for consumers. The small nuclear power plants, what they will do is they will enable us to take the maximum benefit of our existing grid without spending more money on it. According to nuclear scientist and civil engineer Rob Parker, these new generation reactors would be smaller and much safer and would also ensure workers keep their jobs. Workers can be retrained to operate in these plants. I can tell you now, some of the smartest people I have met in our workforce are the workers in our existing coal plants. People who want reliable, predictable power for their populations will build nuclear power. And frankly, compared to renewables, they provide jobs, meaningful jobs to actual Aussies who will work in these plants. We hear a lot about new generations of nuclear power stations that will be inherently much safer, but they don't exist. They don't exist commercially. Paper reactors, ink-powered paper reactors. <laughs> if, we if... may never see commercially fourth generation react. I'm hoping as a younger person that I will, just for the record. <laughs> the fact that these new reactors run for 100 years means it's actually they quite a short time. They haven't been built yet. There's not yeah. one. There's not <laughs> one. For Bob Carr, it's not just a question of technology or safety, but also the lack of political will. And he's prepared to help change that. Here's the challenge, here's the challenge. Here's an invitation to any proponent of a fourth generation reactor Come to me as a former Premier, former Foreign Minister, make a presentation. I will help you shape it to put to every Premier of an Australian state and whether they can offer a location. Let's not have theoretical debates. I agree with you. The future is too important for us not to embrace the discussion about nuclear, to change the laws and to let the economics sure. be tested in the real market. If the fear of radiation from nuclear accidents is one factor in this debate, so too is the issue of safely disposing of radioactive waste from nuclear reactors, including highly reactive spent fuel rods and isotopes produced by the reaction in the core. The nuclear industry says that virtually all the dangerous radiation is contained in only 3% of the waste, which can be stored in secure containers deep underground, the way other hazardous waste is currently disposed of. Can I say, for the layman, the idea is that we've got waste that's going to last for thousands of years. Joe Lackenby, you work in the industry. Are you comfortable, as a young person, that waste is not going to be a serious issue if we have nuclear power. I am comfortable. Right now we do bury other hazardous materials underground. That's totally acceptable. And I don't see why people have some kind of reason to why we couldn't do that to nuclear as well. But it still has to be still. looked after for thousands of years. Why is it that after 60 years of nuclear power, the country with the most nuclear power generation, the United States, still doesn't have a repository for long-term management of radioactive waste. That is a sign. It's a sign of the irresponsibility they... of the industry that they're prepared to produce the waste without having a long-term solution. For people to suggest that there is no solution to the nuclear waste issue is completely and utterly incorrect. You can drill the deep boreholes, go down a kilometre or so into the earth, 
and put the canisters down underground and it will be safe for millions of years. Currently, the only deep geological repository for radioactive waste is in Finland, which is due to start operating next year. But there is potentially another solution. New reactors designed to be fueled by recycling their own waste. They're called fast neutron reactors. Well, with these fast reactors, they can take that fuel and they can burn up the long-lived isotopes that come out of the light water reactors. They can actually burn it up. And so our options for a future with nuclear power is to fully consume what we call close the nuclear fuel cycle and not have long-lived waste. These are, are world-safe, proven technologies, but somehow when it comes into our part of the Pacific Ocean or our part of the Indian Ocean, it becomes too difficult. We're a weird country where scientific solutions are just not accepted by the general public. And in an extraordinary recent breakthrough, scientists are a step closer to developing nuclear fusion. It's the same nuclear reaction that powers the sun and other stars. The collision of two hydrogen atoms at temperatures of 100 million degrees, promising an endless clean energy source with virtually no radioactive waste. A massive fusion reactor is already being constructed in France. The Fukushima nuclear disaster caused Japan to virtually shut down its nuclear energy program. The country had high hopes of meeting its electricity needs with renewable energy. But so far, it's provided only a fraction of what's required. And Japan is heavily reliant on oil and coal-fired power plants. It's much the same here in Australia. And it's what's driving our debate and investigation tonight. Some experts argue that renewable energies like wind and solar will never fully power the planet. They say most countries who've tried are failing. What we're seeing is countries like Germany, a lot of wind, still using a lot of coal, and their carbon emissions are six to eight times higher than the carbon emissions from France, who are running off 70% nuclear. I mean, it just doesn't make sense to me. For Dr. Joanne Lackenby, cutting nuclear out of the future sorry, energy sorry, debate sorry, is irresponsible and irrational. So it's just crazy to me yeah. that the way we're trying to eliminate nuclear out of this conversation when the reality is that nowhere around the world right now has anyone come close to running their electrical grid, let alone their entire energy systems, off just wind and solar. It's true we don't have any country or state operating currently on 100% wind and solar. But we have a situation in Scotland where Scotland is supplying 97% of its electricity consumption from the wind. South Australia is generating 60% of its electricity average over the year from wind and solar alone. You said it was average over the year. What Australians want and I think and expect in, in a modern society is reliability 99.99% of yeah, the time. It is reliable. So if you were to disconnect South Australia from Victoria, for instance, South Australia is not going to be surviving anywhere near 100% of the time on renewable technologies. You can average things over a year, but we, what, what you want to avoid in Australia is any blackouts. We need high reliability. So whatever system we go with in the end has to keep the lights on 99.99% of the time because we as Australians expect it. Can, can I ask Helen, you've heard Joe. do you not hear the passion and the desire to see the future that of young course. people are seeing? If I was a young person now, I'd, I'd be extremely depressed that global warming is occurring apace. I really couldn't see any future because no one's really doing anything about it. We are the biggest exporters of coal in the world. Our politicians are scientifically and medically illiterate. And I really, I have to say, I get, I'm sorry, but I get very upset listening to you people about efficiency and electricity. Are we going to kill people so we can turn our lights on because we have to have nuclear power? It's an evil industry. 
We need to be looking at any technology that we possibly can that can get us to some kind of net zero future. There is an argument by nuclear supporters that renewable energy sources are not only unreliable, but they have a huge environmental impact. Thousands of hectares covered by solar panels and wind farms. And plans for what's known as pumped hydro, storing electricity by pushing water uphill to generate hydropower when it's required. Nuclear scientist and civil engineer Rob Parker is appalled by the idea. I get an absolute fit of the horrors when I think that we're going to put pumped hydro up and down the Great Divide, that we're going to put bulldozers through a lot of the massive hills we've got where eagles live and bird life lives, and we're going to doze these to build more wind turbines, 55 gigawatts of wind turbines. Mankind can have a really elegant, sophisticated lifestyle if he's got energy density. But if we're going to go out there and industrialise our wild environments to provide it, well, we've got to have a big rethink. The nuclear industry and also the fossil fuel opponents of renewable energy claim it occupies a lot of land. We could power the whole of New South Wales with wind and solar using less than 1% of land that is available. Most land on which solar and wind is erected is either agricultural land or marginal land. And it shares that land with all agricultural crops in the case of wind and even sheep in the case of modern solar farms, which are built high enough off the ground for sheep to shelter underneath. The only thing I wouldn't put under a solar collector is a cow. And so this, this whole claims about environmental impact is a complete beat up. The, the and pumped hydro one, uh, just come back on the pumped hydro because he, he's done these sorts of projects in his life and he's a real engineer. Australia has enormous potential for pumped hydro. Now by pumped hydro, I mean that, that when there's an excess of electricity, an excess of wind and solar, Water is pumped from a lower to a higher reservoir. It's a battery. The whole you let the water run down the hill when you haven't got enough, yeah. and you pump it back up when exactly. you've got too much. The pumped hydro scheme, known as the Snowy 2.0 project, is well underway. But with budget blowouts predicted in the billions, nuclear energy advocates suggest the time has come to use a natural resource we have in abundance, uranium. I think it's up to every single country to make up its own mind with its own population. But I have to admit that I'm sitting here thinking, if you look at the electricity map of the world, Australia is almost always black because you use so much coal. Molecular pathologist Professor Geraldine Thomas, who has studied both the Fukushima and Chernobyl disasters, believes the world and Australia should not be running scared of nuclear energy. You're sitting on huge stores of uranium, which you wouldn't have to ship anywhere, you could use in your own country. And really, I think you have to take the decision. Do you want to rely on dirty coal to supplement your solar and wind if you can get it? Or do you want to be able to use the resource that you have on your own landmass to be able to generate large amounts of electricity, which would clearly help you decarbonise your, your systems. It is entirely up to Australia what it does, but from the world perspective, I think you have to look at yourselves and say, how are we going to decarbonise and how are we going to maintain the lifestyle that we want? If there were a future for this industry after Fukushima, there would be a political champion in Australia. According to Bob Carr, the main issue facing nuclear energy in Australia is that no one wants to fund it, including big business. No one, no one, not even Gina Reinhardt, that solid right winger, is, is lining up to put money into an Australian nuclear power industry. And there's a very, very obvious reason. Why? And that is because nuclear power is currently banned in this country. God! Where no, 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 no one's asking to unban it. No one's asking to legalise it. No one's proposing to legalise it. I think what Bob is saying is very important because it's firmly rooted in history. It's not rooted in the future. Look, because okay, the, 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 there is well, 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 the, the, well, let me just say this. Who's, is that who's people the champion? Who's rooting the Eddie, who's, the people? Who's, the, who's the political champion of nuclear power in the Australia? The Andrew Jossie. 
Australia hasn't seriously considered nuclear energy for decades. Not helped by the nuclear accidents at Chernobyl and Fukushima. But is Australia already in the nuclear energy club? Our new defence treaty with the US guarantees a fleet of nuclear submarines. Nuclear submarines have clear advantages. Greater endurance, they're faster, they have greater power, greater stealth, more carrying capacity. But will we need a local nuclear industry in order to service and support the reactors on our new submarines? Let alone, let alone on nuclear... The answer is a firm no, according to former Premier and Australian Foreign Affairs Minister Bob Carr. So I take Scott Morrison at his word. Going for nuclear submarines does not open a debate about domestic nuclear power. A civil nuclear power capability here in Australia is not required to pursue this new capability. We actually had recent polling, a few different polls that actually show that about 70% of Australia's population is open to the idea of nuclear. So they perhaps always have, the, always have. Well, perhaps got, the politicians polls aren't quite aligning with the thoughts of the no. population. It should be noted recent public opinion polls do show that the majority of Australians support nuclear energy as an alternative to fossil fuels. It's cheaper and cleaner, and supporters say more reliable than many renewable energy alternatives like wind and solar. What has happened is that as we've started to understand what we need to do for the planet, there's a very large number of people, uh, typically younger than Mark and I, uh, who actually do want to have a future that is not based on intermittent renewables. The future is too important for us not to embrace the discussion about nuclear to change the laws and to let the economics and the other things be tested in the real market. There are now a number of reasons Australia might have to put nuclear energy back on the agenda, not the least being the need to reach our climate goals. What you gonna say on Judgment Day? The push is on and there seems to have been a shift in public mood. So, is it time to step out of Fukushima's shadow, or should we resist? What's it gonna cost on Judgment Day? Can I ask this of you, Bob Carr, the man who's been steeped in politics all your life, where do you go for reliable, definitive information, the information that the public can say, aha, okay, that's the truth? Because even at this table, I could saw it down the middle yeah. on for and against. I don't think you, it is definitive, you would I think it's all contested. It's, it's, it's in my all books. contested. I've written <laughs> and, many and, books but, about, and, it's, and they're all But referenced. do you get my point here? Uh, I, do you get my point? Box. I think, I think it, it, it's absolutely necessary to have informed public debate. And I think the reason this program is so important is that when we see the impacts of what is happening to the climate, as we have seen recently, and we know that there's a global consensus about climate, the people who care most about climate will include nuclear people, because nuclear people want to be enmeshed in that debate in a positive way, so that it, it isn't a, a sort of a game of tennis where the person who hits hardest and last and the umpire calls it gets the result, because we're all on this tennis court and we're all gonna be on the tennis court for a long time. Um, climate change is such an important topic and the world really does need to build more nuclear and will build more nuclear. But we can build plants with lifetimes up to 100 years and look to make absolute massive reductions in our carbon emissions for periods over 100 years. What will it take for you, Helen, to ever accept nuclear energy as a reasonable you option. Sure. You're talking to me that I must accept a carcinogenic industry increasing disease in my patients and our patients. I took the Hippocratic Oath. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Mark. If we are serious about climate change, about going to zero emissions by 2050, then realistically we have to go to 100% renewable electricity, the latest by 2035. There is no way we will get a nuclear power station in Australia in the next 15 years. Really, nuclear is out of the debate. It cannot do a response in Australia in time, even if we believed it was useful and affordable. Uh, Bob Carr, 
Is it time for us to step out of the shadows of Fukushima? Is it time to put it legitimately on the agenda? We should always keep an open mind that here's a challenge for advocates of nuclear power to give us, give me a proposal and have it tested by the market. Will there be Australian investors? And will it have an Australian community put up its hand and say, yes, on a site of a former coal-fired power station, perhaps we will take a nuclear reactor. I think that is that is a brilliant experiment and I think we should run it. Well, I want to thank you all very much for a robust conversation and, and all your opinions and uh, considerations. It's deeply important. And I thank you for joining me. I'm Liz Hayes. Good night. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes and thank you for watching Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for exclusive clips and don't miss out on full episodes of Under Investigation on Nine Now and the Nine Now app.